Greetings everyone, Team IST warmly welcomes you to this talk on quantum computing. I, Ayushi, and my host Kunal will be the moderators for today's event. The Indian Society for Technical Education, ISTE, is the leading national professional non-profit society for technical education in our country. Team IST is back with another enriching session we have been trying to help students learn various technical skills and grow as an individual. Starting the academic year with events like HALT and PEHIL, we are here with an intriguing talk under the banner of our annual technical fest, Pradyogiki. 
We organize a lot of fun-filled technical events for students of NIT Hamirpur every year under Pradyogiki. The chain of technical sessions, workshops, quizzes, and contests are sure to work as a brainstormer for all of you. A classical computation is like a solo voice, but quantum com computation is like a symphony, many lines of tones interfering with one another. The union of enchanting quantum concepts with modern computing is fascinating, isn't it? Today's talk aims at nurturing that fascination and guiding you on the right path to the world of quantum computing. The audience is free to ask questions and queries in the WhatsApp group, which shall be addressed at the end of this session. Now, my friend Kunal shall be giving a brief intro about quantum computing, which shall be followed by our guest speaker, Mr. Roger Lewis, enriching session. Okay, and now, uh, uh, now I will be starting with the first phase of this session. I'll be giving intro about uh, quantum computing. So let me share my PPT. So is it visible, Ayushi? Yeah, it is visible. Okay, so let us start with the very basics, a classical bit and a quantum bit, also known as a qubit. So the classical bit, I hope most of you already know about this. We all are using classical bits right now. It basically contains a binary value. It can be either zero or a one. And now comes the quantum bit or a qubit. It is basically a two-level quantum system. Uh, this term, two-level quantum system, we will come on this later. Okay, so this contains of basically two states. Either it can be zero or a one. It is basically a linear combination of both the states. Uh, we will come uh, on to this qubit a little later deeply. Okay, so let's uh, move on to the next slide. Okay, so the logical and the physical qubit. Uh, in this session, we will deal with both of these qubits, logical and physical qubits. Basically, the logical qubits are used for creating quantum <coughs> algorithms, and uh, they are they basically command the physical qubits to run on a real quantum hardware. And uh, uh, here I am explaining one type of physical qubit. It's basically a superconducting transmon qubit. It is currently used by IBM and it has certain conditions that it performs on like it uh, performs in a super cool state that's why currently we can't use these qubits in our homes there are some other type of qubits also like photon qubit and other stuff and let's come to next. okay the super cool state so i was telling that these qubits uh, operate at a very low temperature and the temperature is very close to absolute zero. It, uh, to be precise, it's close to 10 millikelvins. And a special type of refrigerator is used to maintain such a temperature known as the dilution refrigerator. Uh, if you search quantum computer on Google, definitely these type of pictures will come up. So these are basically the refrigerators and qubits are placed below these refrigerators. That's when the quantum bits and the uh, quantum gates performs below this refrigerators okay so okay so here come the mathematics part basically the blot sphere is used to represent a qubit here like i have told in the first slide uh, the two level quantum mechanical system we can basically represent qubit in a three level quantum mechanical system also but why we use it to uh, to quantum mechanical system because we can represent one state as zero and other state as one. And it's also easy to use a two level system. Three level system is quite tricky to study. The mathematics part is quite tricky. So that's why we use a two level system. And uh, Hilbert space, I have bolded this word Hilbert space. So after this session, please look for these words that I have highlighted so here comes the like size equal to alpha zero plus beta one 
here the alpha and beta are the probability amplitudes uh, and these are the complex vectors and uh, the alpha square here represents the probability of that quantum state to be in the zero and the beta square represents the probability of that quantum state to be in one and uh, this is known as the bonds rule and alpha square plus beta square is equal to one that's the total probability law and so as this is known as the direct notation also known as the bracket notation and this is how we represent qubits so and also uh, the column vectors this is the notation for a zero vector uh, the matrices and vectors are very important part of this quantum computing so we can't go into that deep but the quantum gates are also represented by matrices and they are basically unitary matrices and there is a, there is a reason why they are unitary matrices because in hilbert space the unitary transformation does not change the probability basically okay so the next ah oh, yes the quantum mechanics this is the tool on which basically the quantum computing works uh, these three concepts mainly are the ingredients on which the quantum algorithms are designed. So the superposition, here, here I have posted a picture of, this is the Schrodinger's cat. So this is a very famous thought experiment by Schrodinger. So basically there is a cat in the box. It is simultaneously dead and alive. And when we see the cat, it's basically, it can be dead or alive, but only one. It can be on in only one state. It can be dead or alive. But when you are not seeing it, it it basically both. It's both dead and alive. Uh, and this is the same thing what happens in a qubit. Uh, the qubit is like in a fluid form. It's basically a mixture of a zero and one. And when we measure it, it collapses into one state. It can be either zero or a one. So the next is interference. I hope most of you already knew about this interference. It is a property of a wave that waves construct. Waves can interfere constructively or destructively and can form a larger or a smaller wave. And then comes the entanglement. It is the like the most important concept in quantum mechanics. So for the quantum computing part only. So I'll come to this. So the quantum superposition, I have given here two definitions. Uh, one is that it can simultaneously exist in various states. I have told this before. And the other one is it is it can be represented by the sum of two or more distinct states. Uh, like this. No, like this. Yes, it is the superposition. So interference is done. So entanglement. Uh, so let me explain it. When we deal in a quantum world, basically, the quantum particles are greatly affected by its surroundings. Means it is affected by the energies of its surrounding particles. So let us take an example of an electron. So when two electrons come at a closed space, so the magnetic fields that an electron exhibit it basically affects the magnetic field of other and they are entangled in such a way that changing the state of one electron also changes the state of other electron like uh, if we have entangled two electrons in such a way that their spins always remain opposite then they are entangled and this can take place like if we have entangled two electrons then it doesn't matter how much distance we place them at they are always entangled and Albert Einstein calls this as the spooky action at a distance. So let us end this. So uh, we are very fortunate to have Mr. Roger Luo amongst us today. Roger is a graduate student at University of Waterloo and Perimeter Institute. He is in interested in exploring quantum many body physics with machine learning and modern methods of programming. 
He is an acclaimed Julia developer who's also the creator of Quantum BFS ecosystem and many other open source packages in Julia language. Roger, we are very excited to have you amongst us today. Without further ado, let's begin the session wherein Roger will be acquainting us all about quantum computing and its scope. Over to you, Roger. Thanks. Thanks, Erwin. Um, thanks for giving me this opportunity to uh, introduce uh, the field. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start sharing screen, I guess. Um, just one sec. Can you see is it? Wait, this is not the uh yes the PPT is visible now. Okay. Uh Uh, somehow this doesn't. Okay, I guess I'll just uh, uh, mirror the screen. Oh, perhaps this is better? OK, this works. OK, um, so um, today I will give you a very brief overview of the field of quantum computing. Um, and first, to introduce myself, and uh, thanks for the host, just, um, for the host uh, in, uh, in, introduction of me. Um, so I'm currently doing uh, a PhD program in the University of Waterloo and Perimeter Institute. Um, and uh, uh, so most people in, uh, know me as the, uh, one of the creators. So, so just uh, to clarify, I'm not the only creator of the ecosystem. Uh, there are other collaborators uh, in the org. Um, so uh, so to talk about the quantum computing, uh, we kind of want to start from the this very basic uh, quantum uh, physics problem, which is called a uh, quantum metabody system. So what is a quantum metabody system? Uh, it is a general name for a vast category of physics uh, problems. Um, and basically, uh, it's about um, the interaction between metabody and with quantum effects. Um, so you can uh, you can uh, you can find this problem exists in many many fields. Like for example, if you want to design a new chemical, uh, you want to know what property property this chemical has. You uh, you have to simulate the uh, your material, and this uh, will uh, encounter this problem. And for example, if you want to build a superconductor and you want to understand why it works, you have to solve this problem. Um, so uh, this is a very basic um, condensed matter problem. 
um, and it it, it uh, cannot exist everywhere in our physical world. As uh, so, phys uh, physicists has been trying to solve this problem using many classical solutions. Uh, for example, density functional theory, which are widely used in chemistry uh, for uh, um, uh, for chemicals, etc. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of condensed matter people use density matrix for normalization group, uh, which we usually just say DMRG, uh, and uh, or more general uh, solutions such as tensor network methods. Um, and the other direction is using Mancalo. So there's two solutions, uh, two, two kind of Mancalo, quantum Mancalo and variational quantum Mancalo. And you perhaps also uh, heard about uh, DeepMind was using uh, neural networks to so, uh, solve um, uh, chemicals. So that's basically a kind of variational Moncalo algorithm. Um, and all these classical uh, methods have uh, limitations. Um, they're usually computational intensive and slow. Uh, for example, uh, this, uh, this, this archive work, um, uh, which uh, which use a tensor network to solve uh, a spin system. It kind of needs the entire Sunway type light summit, which is the largest uh, um, uh, cluster in China. Um, and uh, classical methods is very hard to design, um, and they sometimes not accurate enough uh, in in some uh, system. So, uh, for example, if physics a physicist wants to know about the phase transition of a ground state, uh, the uh, calculation might not be accurate enough to show, uh, to conf confidently tell you this there is a phase transition or not. Um, so uh, physicists like Feynman uh, think, hey, why, why don't we use quantum mechanics to simulate quantum mechanics? So this, this will be a good idea, right? Uh, so, uh, so a lot of physicists were thinking at the beginning to uh, do something called quantum simulation, which is basically uh, use quantum system to simulate another quantum system. Um, on the other hand, uh, there are some um, mathematical problems are just very hard to compute in general. So this is uh, about the complexity of your calculation. Uh, for example, uh, there are some problems are NP hard or NP complete. If you know some of the complexity theory um, on a classical computer, which is the uh, conventional computer we're using today, uh, such as max cal prime factorization, uh, maximum independent set. Um, so these problems, um, there are also traditional ways to solve them. For example, uh, we can just use uh, a very powerful uh, conventional machine, and it's built as a cluster. Um, and or we can use uh, just solve some simple cases, uh, which might be sufficient for some practical case, uh, because uh, there are some efficient algorithms for simple cases. Uh, or we can just find an approximate solution using machine learning. Um, so these are traditional methods, um, but is, is there, uh, they all have limitations, as you can see. Uh, high performance, if you want to program a high performance uh, task, it's going to be uh, quite tedious because you, you need to make uh, thousands of clusters to uh, work together. And it's very hard to find uh, very elegant, uh, efficient algorithms for simple cases as well. And machine learning algorithm usually can only give you an approximate solution, not the exact one. And you probably need to know the exact one just to be sure, um, just to be confident of your answers. Uh, so computer scientists think, uh, so we can actually build a quantum computer, uh, which is the quantum theory machine, um, and uh, then design quantum algorithms uh, for this type of uh, machine, Turing machine, so that we have uh, uh, a better complexity, uh, which uh, is also uh, called as the quantum acceleration. 
so a representative uh, person is Peter Shore, and um, many people know him at, uh, because he even created the Al uh, Peter Shore album that does the um, prime factorization efficiently on quantum computer. Um, so then comes the experiments. So uh, now both physics, uh, theoretical physicists and computer scientists think this is uh, something uh, worth, worth doing. Is it actually possible to do it in, uh, in reality? So um, then people find there are some experimental solutions. Uh, for example, ion trap, you can trap some ions in a magnetic field, and they can uh, you can you can serve as a quantum cube, uh, quantum uh, bit, which is we call qubit. Or you can use uh, superconducting circuits um, to construct a, a qubit. Um, or uh, recent years, we have these popular neutral atoms, such as ripper atoms. Uh, you can build qubits with that, um, and there there are MR methods. Um, photonics methods and even more ambitious uh, topological quantum computing, which is uh, uh, can give you a, a fault tolerant qubit. Uh, so all these solutions are have their advantage and disadvantages. Uh, for example, topological quantum computing seems very promising, but uh, it's the hardest uh, thing to implement uh, experimentally. And Ion Trap. Um, it, uh, for example, new, uh, Neon Trap has its own uh, limitations, um, and uh, new, uh, neutral atoms also. Uh, it, it, you can create many, many qubits with neutral atoms, uh, basically as as much as you want. But uh, um, its uh, neutral atoms are much slower than superconducting circuits. Um, and uh, yeah, actually, I missed the uh, silicon. Uh, um, Circuits, uh, silicon qubits. Uh, so silicon qubits, uh, you can use uh, um, modern industrial um, factories to create these qubits, um, but they are still uh, have worse performance than, for example, superconducting circuits or neuro or neutral at atoms at the moment, in general. Um, so there are some experimental solutions, and uh, basically almost all the top institutes you can think of are doing quantum computing uh, right now. So I list a few of them. Uh, for example, uh, here in Perimeter, there uh, are theorists uh, doing quantum information. In IQC, there are groups doing ion traps uh, and photonic-based solutions. Uh, and there are a superconductive and team based experiment group in Oxford. Uh, also, in my undergrad university, uh, University of Science and Technology of China, uh, they uh, there, there's a uh, uh, Jenny Pan uh, doing the photonic solution. <coughs> um, and Harvard, uh, there's a uh, Miha Looking Harvard doing uh, neutral atoms. Uh, so, so the, uh, I didn't list uh, all the institutes because almost every, uh, almost uh, everywhere, anywhere you can think of, uh, have some has someone doing something related to quantum computing, um, and uh, so the other uh, thing is uh, now quantum computing can uh, half in the industry. So there is a bunch of companies doing quantum computing. Um, so at least some at least some of them here, um, and they kind of have uh, they kind of uh, have different solutions as well. Uh, most of the companies are doing superconducting based uh, uh, experiments, um, and uh, for example, uh, Microsoft kind of do uh, do uh, wants to try to do topological quantum computing. Um, and IonQ does, uh, you can tell from its name, it does uh, Ion Trap. Um, so, uh, so, so uh, what can quantum computing do in near term? What kind of application it, uh, it might have? Um, so, there are basically four kinds of applications uh, chemistry. 
um, combined, uh, combinatoric optimization, cryptography, uh, and machine learning. So I'll list uh, four papers here, uh, which are basically uh, most, uh, I think, most representative work uh, in a different direction. Um, so, but in near term, uh, so what we have are noisy intermediate quantum devices. They're not perfect. You probably only have 99, uh, the one percent uh, fidelity for single qubits, and only 95 percent fidelity for um, for a five qubit readout. So that means you have to work with errors. And the uh, the gate operation time is also quite slow. You, as you can see, it, it, uh, the ion trap operation is much much slower than a C normal uh, and then conventional CPU clock time. Um, so um, so in near term, people kind of think this uh, what we can do are variational algorithms. Um, so. So we kind of develop this framework for uh, variational frame, uh, variational algorithms. Um, so this, uh, so in case you haven't heard about Julia, um, uh, all the work we did are um, based on Julia. Uh, it's a very nice language. It's um, um, it's uh, it's a language aimed for technical work, uh, such as MATLAB and Python. Um, and it has this flexibility uh, like Python, but as fast as C. I kind of steal this slide from Stephen Johnson. Um, so if you want to know more about Julia, you can just check this website, julialand.org. Uh, so now let's go and uh, come back. Uh, what are uh, variational quantum algorithms? Uh, so near, near term, uh, variational quantum algorithms uh, basically says we have a parameterized quantum circuit. So there are some parameters we can tweak on the actual quantum device, and we use a classical computer to tweak the parameters. So we turn the uh, problem into an optimization problem, and we just sit there and hope uh, the classical optimization procedure can help us uh, cure some of the error and uh, and we don't actually need to, to find very complicated and elegant, well-designed quantum algorithm that has uh, a very um, precise quantum speed up. Um, so there are um, currently three, um, basically uh, three frameworks designed for uh, developing uh, this type of uh, variational algorithms. Um, and why would we, would, would we need a software to do this type of job is because uh, now you're doing, um, you're trying to optimize a parameterized quantum circuit. Um, it's not easy to do it analytical anymore. So you have to do numerical simulations uh, a lot. Um, so that's why people uh, create these um, softwares uh, so there are Kuski, Penny Lane, and ours Yao. Uh, the first two are kind of Python-based. Uh, Yao is the only Julia-based one. Um, so th this is the very first work uh, uh, demonstrate how variational quantum uh, algorithm works in experiments. It's called the variational quantum Eigen solver. Uh, what it does is very simple. It just uses a five qubit uh, to solve the ground state of the hydrogen. Uh, atom. Uh, it only has one parameter, so it's very uh, looks very trivial, but uh, it's actually not that trivial because you have to actually implement that in, in the experiment. Um, so this is the first step uh, where people started. You can see the setup as here. Uh, basically, you marry the Hamiltonian, you get energy, and you try to optimize the parameter, and you get uh, you you can optimize the energy, so eventually you will get the ground state. Uh, then there are following works. Uh, for, uh, like, um, so uh, in the following work, people find uh, how to differentiate the circuit. So before, uh, we don't know how to differentiate the circuit in an actual experiment. So you have to use non-gradient-based optimization. 
However, um, in recent years, uh, it started from machine learning community, um, and it's from Yang Le Quinn was saying, uh, hey, we there's a new type of uh, uh, way of programming, which is called differentiable programming. That's going to be the, uh, the next generation of software engineering. Where you do, uh, where your software are always differentiable, so that you can always tweak your software based on gradient uh, feedback, so, um, and in that way you can solve a lot of problem uh, in a very elegant and efficient way. Um, so then uh, people realize uh, for uh, for parameterized quantum circuit, there are actually a very uh, elegant form of its gradient, which is. Um, which we call the parameter shift rule. Uh, it was first uh, um, described in this quantum circuit learning paper and later used by many, many other version of quantum uh, circuit papers. Um, and now it is kind of integrated with the automatic differentiation engine uh, that you use in, for example, PyTorch or in Juliet and the Zygote uh, differenti differentiation engine. Um, so um, you can you can uh, write quantum uh, circuits and program your quantum circuits and, and make use of the gradient to optimize your uh, loss. So that makes um, this uh, the general framework more and more like a, a conventional machine learning task. Um, and usually gradient-based optimizer have much better performance than the uh, non-gradient-based uh, optimizers. Um, so uh, next, then uh, people realize uh, we actually need to find what kind of uh, circuit structures are there, and how do we actually find out the circuit structures? Um, so conventionally, um, people have been Keep using tensor network methods to use uh, uh, to, um, to solve uh, some of the uh, quantum system efficiently. So, um, so then we know uh, there are some certain type of uh, tensor network structures that can be uh, executed efficiently, and, and they can represent uh, some quantum state efficiently. Um, so in near term, we can we only have a limited number of qubits. We need to think how to actually make the uh, how to actually make uh, every qubit useful in your experiment. For example, I only have uh, a twenty qubit. I can't really do uh, a, a one hundred qubit algorithm. So I, I need to find a way to actually do something useful on this twenty qubit machine. Uh, so this paper can kind of give you a way to uh, reuse this, uh, the qubit on the device. Um, and then this actually creates a simulation um, uh, issue because uh, you have to reuse the state. And you, uh, in the simulation, we want to help you uh, simulate faster. So uh, we can develop uh, kind of uh, a batched uh, a parallel uh, optimize uh, parallel simulator, so you can uh, you you can ask you the batch of registers, so that you can uh, you can simulate uh, uh, this algorithm more efficiently. Um, so uh, so, uh, so the most important thing, uh, differentiable programming circuits. There are a few papers demonstrate this idea where you actually differentiate um, a hybrid program, which contains a quantum circuit and a classical program. The classical program might be a neural network, and the quantum part is a quantum circuit. You can differentiate them together uh, and optimize them together uh, so that you can solve, for example, uh, an icing um, problem. Or you can find uh, you can use it to find ground states, so that you can solve the a many on a many body problem. Um, so uh, uh, so with all these um, potential applications, we build this ecosystem around the intermediate representation. 
which uh, eventually evolves in as a compiler. Um, and it, this uh, works powered by Julia and the ecosystem of Julia, where uh, you can get the best uh, differential equation solvers. Um, and the machine learning uh, framework flux. Uh, and the, the, uh, the full language automatic differentiation engine cycles, um, as well as uh, a very rich uh, ecosystem of uh, st uh, statistics in, under Julia Statics. Um, and uh, uh, symbol even symbolic calculation automatically enabled by Julia's type system via symbol uh, same engine. And most importantly, uh, the, uh, I think uh, the richest uh, optimization ecosystem in the world um, developed by the optimization community in Julia. Um, and and uh, also the differentiation organization, Julia Diff. Uh, so at last, I want to show off a little bit uh, of our performance um, comparing to all other uh, frameworks and remember this is all written just in pure Julia, not C++ or Python. And you can see we're one of the best. Um, and uh, uh, Qlax is the one right, uh, written in pure C++. Um, and the, for the GPU part, there's only 300 lines of code uh, written in pure Julia. Um, and you can achieve um, the best performance using just 300 lines of code instead of 1,000 lines of C++, uh, which I think is one of the reasons why we're using Julia for uh, for the entire ecosystem. Uh, so last I list uh, a few research papers um, that give you, an open, that if you want to learn more about this field and how uh, variational algorithms and machine learning, uh, work with quantum computing, um, you can uh, go ahead and read these papers. Um, so that's, uh, and uh, and uh, finally, so in, as final slide, uh, if you want to join um, open source, this open source effort, you can um, go to this website and uh, start looking at a bunch of resources and power your own research. So um, uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. That was a truly wonderful talk. Now I shall be asking questions uh, that have been asked in the chat box on the behalf of our students. So uh, let us start with it. Okay, so here is the first question in the chat. So the question is, algorithmic trading and use of advanced computer already give an upper hand to institutional traders across all asset classes. Will the advent of quantum computer widen the gap between have and have nots? Um, I think it depends uh, on what uh, the specific problem so potentially quantum computers are uh, useful for some uh, certain optimization problems, but uh, we haven't really implemented them in, in our real device and demonstrate uh, the advantage of uh, the quantum uh, the quantum uh, the quantum optimization algorithm. Um, so, but there are many potential candidates of this that that they. Uh, that we may be able to demonstrate uh, quantum advantage um, uh, on a practical problem. Uh, it kind of uh, so I, uh, I would say let's let's uh, if, so first thing is we need to wait and see uh, if there are actual quantum algorithms give you the acceleration on certain uh, on these optimization problems 
um, if there are, and if you apply that on uh, some actual uh, treating models that uh, need this optimization, um, then I think uh, the quantum computing will give you an advantage. However, if uh, we can't find uh, a practical um, algorithm that uh, can give you the quantum advantage, then um, I don't see why it widened the gap between have and fab have not. Yes, it's completely true. Okay. So. Okay, so let me add something to it. So basically, as uh, the Roger said, uh, so the quantum computers are faster than classical computers for certain calculations only. Like here, the question has been asked for algorithmic trading. So quantum computer can't do everything that a classical computer can do. It is faster for certain calculations only. So here's the next question. So the next question is, oil giants were the leaders in market caps. And now after internet revolution, almost all indices are ruled by tech companies. What companies are poised to lead basically? Who could be the next thing? Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, or Google? That's a hard question. Um, I mean, I, if I can predict, I'll be a millionaire. Right. Um, so I would say, uh, from the perspective of science, um, and Amazon and Google has already doing quantum computing. Uh, so I would say there are uh, there there are many companies are um, trying to uh, to do something with quantum computing, but we're not sure if this is actually useful. If it is, if people find, uh, if if we can find, for example, finally accomplished. Uh, uh, what we want to do with quantum computing, for example, designing drugs, then that definitely worth a lot of money. But if if we can't, then it doesn't worth nothing. Okay. So the next question is, how do we combat the high error rates in quantum computing? Yeah, this is this is a good question. Uh, so the, the, this is also uh, still a research topic. Um, so uh, so this is uh, so what we want to do is uh, one thing we want to do is to do error correction, where you encode one logical qubit with uh, several physical qubits. Uh, for example, the 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 most trivial one is a short three um, um, the the sh a short code. Uh, where you can embed one one logical qubit with nine qubits, uh, so uh, any uh, any t uh, uh, error that is a uh, type of error called poly error, uh, hap if happens on this qubit, it can be automatically corrected. Um, so this type of uh, encoding is used actually in modern uh, conventional communication uh, already, for example, you use repetition code, where you just represent uh, one zero with three zeros. And if you see uh, zeros are the most of the numbers in your uh, bytes, you just uh, think that uh, that bit, that logical bit is one byte, or is a zero. Um, and there, but for the quantum, uh, problem of quantum, there are more interesting solutions, like the topological quantum computing, we use the topological property uh, to protect your qubit. Uh, and on the other hand, in near term, um, we, uh, we, we, can't, we don't have enough qubit to do the um, uh, to the error correction. So what, what can we do? Uh, the other thing we can do is call error mitigation. So basically, you can find out the statistics of your error and then uh, uh, apply uh, randomly apply some gates after your circuit so that you correct, uh, you, uh, you can uh, mitigate um, part of error and ma uh, make the error rate lower. OK. That was a really great answer. So we can move on to the next question now. OK, so the question is, how does quantum computing help in analysis of big data and help in choosing the most optimum solutions? 
Um, so it still depends on the problem. Uh, if you're talking about uh, more um, some older work like HHL, uh, which is uh, uh, about solving uh, a linear equation on, uh, on a quantum computer, um, so usually a lot of algorithm based on HHL uh, has uh, the problem that the, they might need a, qu uh, a quantum RAM, uh, which is probably doesn't exist. Uh, so uh, converting a classical data, uh, a piece of classical data to your quantum device uh, can be very hard. Um, so it might not be that useful for classical data. However, uh, I think it, the most promising part is uh, using quantum device to actually solve the, a quantum problem. Uh, there are a lot of problems in this world that involves quantum mechanics. Uh, for example, uh, chemicals and, for example, design drugs, design materials. You need to simulate uh, the materials. Uh, so in that way, you have, uh, for example, there, there are a lot of data in chemistry. Uh, there can be a lot of data in a quantum experiment. Um, so you can use your quantum computer to process uh, those data directly instead of uh, uh, transfer them to uh, from classical to quantum. Um, so I think, I think this part is more promising. Um, and uh, if, uh, so regarding your second part uh, about choosing the most optimal solution, um, if you're talking about uh, quantum optimization, uh, for quantum optimization, um, um, there's, recent, uh, there's a popular method called Q QAOA recently, which is quite pr promising uh, for solving optimization problems on near-term device. Uh, for this type of algorithm, um, it's basically, uh, designed to be able to naturally encode uh, a certain type of optimization problem, which is NP-complete, um, on your uh, Hamiltonian, so that when you optimize this type of, uh, uh, you optimize the parameters, you uh, you automatically get the optimal solution of your uh, result. Or on the other hand, you can also do adiabatic quantum computing. That's uh, Encodes your optimal solution in the ground state. Uh, I don't. I don't think I have uh, much time to actually uh, tell you what it, uh, the details about adiabatic quantum computing, but that's the thing to read about. Great. So let's see the next question now. Okay, I guess it is related to Shor's algorithm. So the question is, if the quantum computer is able to factorize the prime number, which is basics of modern cryptography, what will happen to cybersecurity? And is there is a, any way to counter that? Uh, so there are solutions, there are, there are more uh, intensive solutions that can be saved and to even quantum uh, attack from quantum, a quantum computer. Uh, however, uh, I, th I think um, uh, in your time, we don't need to worry about that because uh, uh, if you want to actually run the shore out of them, you will need uh, uh, something like a thousand, at least more than a thousand logical qubit. Uh, that doesn't seem very possible in near term. Uh, and even we have that, uh, there are uh, things like lattice code, et cetera, to actually, uh, which are actually safe from quantum attacks. So um, I don't think cryptography is uh, some, or cybersecurity is something you should worry about. Okay. Okay, so it is related to Julia. So how do you see the future of Julia in scientific computing? Do you think it will be heavily adopted just like Python or will it remain focused on a selective community of researchers? And uh, there is a follow-up question. Uh, what future advancements can we see in yao.jl? Um, 
So first, to answer the first question, so I definitely think Julia is the future of scientific computing. Um, this is mainly because um, Julia has some techno uh, technical advantage. Um, so it the uh, Julia. So so this is back to the problem. Why why would we need a new language at all? Why why can't we just uh, say build a just in time compiler for Python and you know accelerate existing Python code? Um, so if you read about uh, a very early blog post from the developer of PyStorm, which is I think the a very early um, effort on creating a just-in-time compiler for Python. Um, so the problem for accelerating Python code is just hard, and it's probably not possible at all, because um, a lot of Python code is actually not written in Python. It is written in C uh, using the Python C API. So if you want to accelerate the Python package, you actually need to accelerate uh, C runtime, which doesn't seem very easy. So even you build a just in time compiler, it can only accelerate some parts that is not very uh, intensive in performance. It doesn't even need high performance. Um, so um, and, and besides that, uh, for scientific computing, most people using uh, scientific computing are scientists. Scientists don't want to write two languages or three languages because they don't. They always get very less money, and they they just want their work to be done. Uh, so previously, people uh, choose MATLAB and Python because they, this is uh, there are a lot of tools built in it. Python has NumPy, which um, actually runs your uh, simul matrix multiplication. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in BLAS. Um, however, uh, as, as there are many new fields emerging in science, right? So they're always um, being, uh, they're always uh, necessary to write some high performance code. And if you don't want, and I, I guess no one want, actually wants to write C++, so uh, you still want to write something like Python, so that's Julia. Um, and uh, so uh, yeah, so so why do we actually need a new language? This is because Julia Semantics is not designed for interpreter, uh, where uh, uh, the previous language like Python, uh, Lisp, um, Lua are kind of their semantics are designed for interpreter, so they are not very friendly to optimizers, uh, which is one of the reason why they are not fast. Uh, so Julia semantics is designed around uh, uh, the just-in-time compiler. So uh, this is one of the reasons why it's fast. Uh, so uh, based on the current uh, uh, trend, uh, I can see a lot of people in the quantum field has been uh, starting uh, using Julia. And, and even uh, there's a few companies start to using Julia. Uh, and, and and I uh, since I currently uh, can half time in a, a quantum computing company as well, uh, so this com uh, this quantum computing company is full stack Julia. Uh, so as you can see, uh, I'm pretty sure Julia will be the future and will be adopted widely, at least in the field of quantum physics. Um, so uh, for the future advancements uh, in Yale, uh, we're now develop. Uh, so so previously uh, we have uh, we have one of the best simulators. Uh, we have uh, uh, one of the most efficient um, uh, differentiation engine, uh, and in the future uh, we're gonna uh, we're planning to develop a new compiler. Which compiles your code, uh, your native Julia code, to quantum uh, actual quantum power. So, which means you don't need to learn a new language. If you know Julia, you can pro uh, you can program things on uh, a quantum power, just like how you do with GPUs in Julia. You you don't need to know much about. You still need to know what is parallel computing, but you don't need to learn a complete new language to program a, a different hardware. Uh, so Julia offers a very elegant platform to do heterogeneous programming. Um, 
so this is one of the next step in uh, in Yale. And on the other hand, uh, we kind of uh, we're more focusing on optimizing real experiments, uh, op optimizing uh, things for real experiments. So for example, optimize, simplify your quantum circuits um, and compile your quantum circuit to um, a more suitable form for, for certain hardware. Uh, so last year, we uh, started the work on uh, based on the X calculus to do the circuit simplification. And uh, we are now uh, working on a new type of representation called QL, which uh, make use of um, the topological property of, uh, of your circuits to simplify the circuits. So I will see uh, all these works are uh, will be cutting edge uh, stuff, and you probably won't see in other Python-based software. OK, I hope the query related to Julia is clear now. So I guess uh, we should end this Q&A session. Ayushi. Thank you, Roger. That was a truly enriching experience. I hope our audience took valuable lessons and shall implement them in their future pursuits. We thank you for sparing the time to be with us today and wish you the best of luck for your future endeavors. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I guess see you, see you guys then. Thank you. Now, Kunal shall be taking over and continuing the session. Uh, so now we are at the last phase of the session. And this is the totally practical one. OK, so stay tuned for that. Uh, I hope you all have made your IBM IDs. Uh, let me share the link. Okay, now a link will be shared in your WhatsApp group. Uh, just go to that link and sign in with your IBM ID. And then we can start with the session. You can just type yes in your WhatsApp group that we have made related to this workshop. If you are done with signing in in the quantum experience platform, just type yes and it will start in a minute or two then. Okay. Are you sure is the tab visible? Yeah, it is now. OK, cool.
Okay, guys, make it fast. Okay, so now I think I should start. Yes, uh, so basically, uh, here are the icons you are seeing. These are basically the quantum gates. Here you can see the pop up coming up. H gate, it is the Hadamard gate. It is used to create a superposition of a qubit. Here, the qubit you are seeing, the Q0, it is basically in an equilibrium state or a zero state right now. And if you place a Hadamard gate here, it creates a equal superposition. Let me blade this. Yeah, it's zero or one with a equal probability. So yes, we will come to it later. So yes, there are the gates, the head mar gate, the not gate, the C not gate. There are many gates. Uh, we can't deal with uh, all of them right now. But in the starting of this session, I have told you that these gates are based mathematically the unitary matrices or Hermitian matrices. So remember that thing. Okay, so now I shall start with the NOT gate here. So if we place a NOT gate here. So yes, you can see the one is coming up. And we have to measure this. It is used for measuring. The Q0 here you are saying is the quantum bit and C1 is the classical bit. If you measure it, here the probability will come. Okay, so NOT gate is used to flip the state. Like it flips uh, 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. And when we measure it, it changes into the classical bit. Uh, the NOT gate is also known as the poly X gate. It basically rotates uh, the block sphere I have shown you before. Uh, it rotates it about the X axis basically in mathematics. If we want to see it that way. So now what we are going to make now is the entanglement circuit. We are going to entangle two qubits. So yeah, let's do it right now. So I want all of you to add a qubit here. Uh, the plus sign you are seeing here, uh, just click it. And there are two qubits now, Q0 and Q1. And what you have to do now is first remove this NOT gate and basically place a head mark gate here. Uh, it will create a superposition of, it is basically uh, in the superposition form, it is like one upon root two bracket zero plus one. The probability amplitude of both are 1 by root 2. And the probability is the square of that amplitude. That is 1 by root 2 square. That is half half. So it means it, it is creating a 50% probability of that quantum state to be in a state 0 and 50% to be in state 1. So now C0 gate. Okay, so let me come to this gate now. Uh, C0 gate is like an if else gate based uh, in a classical uh, language if i say so if the uh, initial qubit like it is the control qubit the q0 is known as the control qubit and q1 is the target qubit if the q0 is 1 uh, like if the state is uh, of it is 1 then it will change uh, the target qubit to it will flip the state of the target qubit if the control qubit is zero, it will not affect the target qubit. Like it depends, it completely depends upon the control qubit. If it is one, it will flip the state of that target qubit. So this is basically the entangled state. So I know most of you are confused right now how this is entangled. Uh, but this is it, the, uh, the superposition is created here. And if it 
if this is qubit is 0, it is also 0. And if this qubit is 1, it will change this 0 to 1. So basically, the result here, we will see that uh, the result. Yes. So the result is coming up 1, 1. So you are seeing that the qubits are entangled. If the first qubit is one, the second qubit is also coming up as one. So if we increase that uh, simulator seed here, it is basically the random numbers they have generated. It will refresh this. Okay, let's refresh it once again. Oh yeah, so you can see this, the one one is shifted to zero zero. Uh, the next time you have run this circuit, it is coming up as zero zero because the superposition is created here in Hadamard gate. So it will come up as 0, 0 or 1, 1 because the, both the qubits are entangled to each other. So uh, let us go now. So I hope you are getting it. So I'm just watching the WhatsApp group for two minutes. If you have handed out, just put it on there, okay? Yes. I'm just waiting for a minute if you have any doubts. Then I guess we should move on. Yeah, sure. We can entangle more pair of qubits. Like if we increase these gates, like if, if I add another qubit here and uh, another C0 gate here, it will entangle three qubits. So another question. Okay, I think we should move on. Oh, so if you have signed in by your IBM ID, just go here in the run settings and here you will see the system. And here you can see the real quantum computers working right now. They are all online. So in the brackets, it, see, it is the specifications of that quantum computer like the it is running currently five qubits and the quantum volume is 32. Yesterday there was a discussion in the group about quantum volume. Yes, uh, the answer he the guy gave was right. It basically represents it uh, basically the specify how advanced is our quantum computer. There is no particular calculation of this number. It basically uh, includes all the quantum circuits, qubits, and other things, the advancements in that computer. So yes, these are the systems and the queue here. How many circuits are currently in the queue? How many commands other people have given? Like the 70 circuits have to be run on this. So we will take uh, a circuit which is not busy, a uh, computer which is not busy. So yeah, this is the one, I guess. There is no one working on it right now. So we will take this. So yes, now we will run it on IBM Quasm Simulator. Now the job is sent. Okay, it is completed. So you can see it here. Okay, let me stop sharing screen. So here, uh, the final result is here. As you know, quantum computer is very fast and that quantum computer has no circuit uh, currently running, so it was free. You can send the job to the circuit. The backend is IBM Quasm Simulator and your circuit will run. Other are currently working, so yes, you can. 
So you can see uh, the zero zero is coming up 47.661% of times and one one is coming up 52.339% of times. And the shorts you are seeing 1026. So there is also thing that uh, this simulator is this is a simulator not a real one so i guess if we run it here it will take much of our time so let's run it on ibm or mock okay okay but Wait a second. It only runs one qubit. So let's check this out. So it is queued. You can see the expected time to run is like 36 minutes. So it is not currently possible that you all can run in that because mine circuit is taking 30 minutes approx. Because many of the researches are, are going on currently in these circuits. So uh, the previous circuit, I have told this, uh, the previous hardware, IBM Cosm Simulator, it is just like a real quantum, a real quantum computer but it is not the superconducting qubits are not working here right now so later on after after the session you can check this back end okay okay i have not shared my screen Yes, so yes, I was telling about uh, this one, IBM Q Athens. You can see the expected time to run is uh, right now is 17 minutes. So we can't wait for that. So after this session, please uh, run it on a, a real hardware. Just don't run it on uh, our mock because it basically supports only one qubit right now so just check other ones and these are the ones which are under maintenance right now so i think that was it about the entangled circuit if you have any doubts just post it in the group Here you can see there's an error coming up. It is basically problem with the system. These systems are very busy right now. You can try running them in uh, like night time. At night it is quite not busy, unbusy, I guess. I have tried yesterday night many system were not busy at that time okay so uh, okay now i'll share some links to you here you can see the docs are there and i'll suggest you all to just go through these docs and here you can start from the very basics like the circuit composer create your first quantum circuit and many other things and here you can grasp the 
basic concepts of quantum computing the qubit superpositions interference quantum phase single qubit bits and the algorithms and uh, these are the main algorithms which are currently used right now the grover's algorithm the shows algorithm quantum phase estimation due josja josa algorithm yes these are basically underused so i like to tell you something that uh, like this is repeated many times that quantum computer solves certain problems faster than the classical computers not all the problems uh, at the end what happens is in a quantum computer we interfere the results like the interference we have seen it interferes that and increases the probability of the answer it is what happens in all the algorithms in the current quantum algorithms like in the grover's algorithm it is a, a search algorithm basically if uh, you have if you, you know python there is a list in python if you search in that unstructured unstructured search if you say uh, if you run that like on an average it takes about n by 2 steps like if there are n elements in that list it takes n by 2 average steps but a quantum computer takes root n steps that's where the speed of quantum computer comes up so i can't go into the deep because of the time constraints so we will share the links of these docs and at last i like to tell you about the qiskit is loading <sighs> if you know python the basics of python you can start working on it it is uh, it works on a jupyter notebook and you can set it up locally or you can work it on a cloud if you go to the circuits part and yes uh, it is python notebook uh, let me share Yes, uh, this is the Python notebook. Here, what you have to do is, you have to import this from Qiskit. Import everything. It will import all the functions and what is included. Like you can build your quantum circuit here. And there is a very nice documentation in this. So you can start with very basics and start building your own quantum circuits. Uh, so yeah, the link will be shared in the WhatsApp group and yes, I guess it's done. All right, so on behalf of Team ISD, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. And we hope you gained some valuable insights and shall be striving for more knowledge in the future. Thank you and have a good day.